Any normal person who would have bought this house would have knocked it down and started from scratch. This is the story of an abandoned shack transformed by the hands of an artist into this improbable mansion. There was no blueprint. There was, you know, it was just like seemed to be in his head. In a small country town. A place that reminds you of a bygone era. It just seems like something you would have seen in a TV series in the 1970s. And how one man's perseverance, stubbornness, and artistic obsession transformed an entire community. It's um, very inspiring, actually. The reason people like to come to Stoke State Forest is just to get away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Uh, you come here, it's quiet, it's peaceful, there's nature everywhere, it's really beautiful. Uh, but in addition, there's a lot of things to do while you're here. Um, hiking, we have the Appalachian Trail that runs through Stoke State Forest. Uh, we also have camping, cabins, swimming. Uh, it's a great place to see nature. So I think people, when they're here, they just feel good. They feel relaxed, and I think that's what is all about this area, is coming to get away from it all and just, just enjoying yourselves. Located in Sussex County, northwest of New Jersey, and 100 kilometers or 62 miles from Manhattan, Stokes State Forest is a playground for tens of thousands of outdoor enthusiasts looking to enjoy the 6,000 hectares or 15,000 acres of preserved woodland. It's a serene and quiet place to live, and yet it's proximity to other uh, major cities is wonderful too. You can be, uh, you can go to work till five o'clock, you can come home, change, get into the city, see a play, go to dinner and get back in the same day. And that's, that's an amazing thing. Located off Route 206, which crosses the Stokes State Forest, the small town of Sandyston seems stuck at a slower pace of life than the nearby metropolises. Sandyston, New Jersey is um, a place that reminds you of a bygone era. It just seems like something you would have seen in a TV series in the 1970s, you know. But uh, uh, it's a beautiful little town with uh, a lot of... Um, old homes that are nicely restored. There are um, several key families that who live here. You know, the grandparents own the farm and the sons and, and grandchildren and great-grandchildren are in the area. So it's a neighborhood of people where um, the firemen are volunteers, the, the mayor is also the insurance broker. And so you're, you're very connected in a community that is very supportive. It's a very small township, about roughly 2,000 people. Uh, the people who live here are probably the greatest people you're ever going to want to meet because they help each other. It's kind of like, uh, everybody laughs at me when I say it, it's kind of like an Amish town with uh, anybody that needs help, everybody else pitches in and they help. A stone's throw from the picturesque heart of Sandyston, at the end of a winding path, there awaits a surprise no visitor is prepared to discover. The first time I saw Luna Park, I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe there was a place like that in Sussex County, New Jersey. You, you feel like you're out in nature and to find this really creative, colorful, majestic place um, with such a sense of whimsy. It's just a breath of fresh air. Wow. <laughs> that sums it up. It really was. It was a wow factor. But there's so much to look at and so much to take in every time you turn, you know, whether it be in the yard or the outside of the house or the inside of the house. This strange house painted in psychedelic colors occupies an area of 900 square meters or 9,700 square feet and extends over no less than 13 levels. The two hectares or five acres of land have been transformed into a sculpture garden. Inside, the three meter or 10 foot high ceilings and multi-tiered landings offer surprising sights wherever the eye rests. But the house's most fascinating fact is that all of its construction is the result of one man's efforts. This is the story of Ricky Boscarino, 
creator of Luna Park. My name is Ricky Boscarino, otherwise known as Ricky of Luna Park. And you are here at my home, which is called Luna Park, uh, P-A-R-C, which is named after an amusement park outside the city limits of Rome, uh, not the amusement park in Coney Island, as many people think. To the outside world, Luna Park is an artistic attraction. For Ricky, it's home. It's, uh, you know, it's not your uh, conventional uh, house you saw built. I mean, I've seen pictures of it and, you know, heard about different things, his bathroom and, you know, the different colored tiles and the different levels. So when he did it basically mostly by himself, so he came up with some different ideas. Luna Park is listed by renowned online magazine Business Insider as one of 19 experiences not to be missed in New Jersey. Not far behind the Statue of Liberty. It's a labor of love, what he's done there. I mean, you look at it from the road, you think, my gosh, what is that? But when you're there and you walk around and see every little intricate thing that he's added, that he's done, it's amazing. It's really, I mean, it's an art house. It's not just a home. He poses that question, doesn't he? I mean, what is a house? What is a house? Is it a place to live or is it a place to, you know, make it to your artistic vision? Ricky Boscarino was born in New Jersey in 1960. His grandparents were Sicilian, but his parents were born in the United States. He comes from a long line of craftsmen, carpenters, cabinet makers, tailors, seamstresses. I remember making a table out of a, um, out of a tree trunk um, that, that uh, fell down and I cut the, the the, the branches and made legs and then cut a plywood table with a little a, a band around it and finished it really beautifully. And uh, it was in our house for years and years. Probably started in the womb, you know, with that's when we, we really like absorbed and understood these old world uh, artisan values. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Ricky is really um, an artist that can work through all different materials. It's very apparent that anything he, he can get his hands on becomes a creative act. When he was very young, he felt a strong need to create. He began by learning the craft of making jewelry. And we had an amazing arts program. It was almost like going to an arts high school, which was very unusual for a public high school, especially at the time in the 70s. And that's really where I got my foundation for making jewelry, was in high school. I have just created here is a pair of earrings. The hobby soon became a livelihood, but Ricky didn't want to work just anywhere. He needed a large work area where he could unleash his creativity in private. He found an ideal site in Sandyston, New Jersey, not far from where he grew up, and bought himself a rundown, abandoned hunting cabin. When I first bought this house, the, the condition wasn't deplorable, but it was a real, what we call, fixer-upper. It needed complete renovation. It needed uh, all new electric insulation. It needed new windows. Any normal person who would have bought this house would have knocked it down and started from scratch. And sometimes I think the reality is it probably would have been easier had I started from scratch, but I needed a place to live. Upon taking possession, the cabin had been empty for 10 years. Ricky had to make do with just a few rooms and an outdoor toilet. But with the help of his sister, the creative mind of an artist quickly worked wonders. My younger sister, Joanne, is a very good carpenter as well. And she and I framed this structure 
uh, with help from her partner and, um, and then uh, several other friends. And we uh, lifted these walls like a good old traditional Amish barn raising. And it was so exciting to see this whole room within a day, all of a sudden it sprung up. Once I saw the first, the initial walls, then I can get a concept of this whole project. Well, it's been really organic, the whole process. When I first saw the place, it, the kitchen hadn't been redone. It was a little bathroom, a little ugly bathroom. And now it's an amazing bathroom. But it's evolved, and uh, I think he's let it happen. He's gone with the flow. He's just looked at it and said, I want to put a room here. I want to put a secret passageway there. I want to put a library here. And he's just done it. And there were no sketches. There was no blueprint. There was, you know, it was just like seemed to be in his head. And as he built it, we're like, oh, like, what are you doing? You know, the huge hole. I was like, what? It was, a mud, it was all muddy. And he's like, what the heck is he doing? I mean, and, you know, I have to say, he's made us all believers. Because step by step, it started just taking shape. When, when Ricky's building the house, he'll put on a room, and it's not done, but he'll decorate it. <laughs> and then he'll decide, of course, that it has to be finished, so then everything has to come out and be moved around, and then he puts on another room, and that goes into that room, and then it's redecorated, and then it comes back down. So it's a constant uh, evolution of decoration and, and building and design and construction. I think that's what makes it work, is he'll go and he'll sit in a room, he'll put stuff up, and then he'll say, you know, I'm going to put these big wheels over on that wall because I have them up in the shed, and I didn't know what to do with them, and it'll become a sculpture. Before he put it all together, he didn't realize that's what he was going to do. So I think he finds inspiration in the things he collects and in the spaces that he creates and lets that evolve into what you see now. Ricky is a tireless collector. Every object he unearths has a function or it ends up in his personal museum. I can actually boast that there are over 550 bowling balls around the property, uh, collected one by one by uh, people who uh, come visit. Um, I find them at yard sales. 50 cents is my absolute top price that I'll pay for a bowling ball. As space filled up, Ricky added new parts to the building. After 24 years of work, Luna Park has a workshop, a library, a laboratory, some multi-purpose rooms, and even a ballroom. I refer to the house in its present uh, state of maturity as the Museum of the New Alchemy. Uh, they believed that all materials originated from gold and through a series of processes, they could be returned to gold. The materials could be um, discarded bottles, tile, stone, metal, glass, wood, even uh, the corks on my uh, kitchen walls. So in my analogy is that Art is gold. All materials transformed through a series of processes could be transformed into art. You don't have to be an artist to appreciate what Ricky does because he takes everyday objects that we're familiar with, and uses them in a different context. So if you understand a little bit more, you might see references in the work that are a little deeper, but um, I think it's very approachable work. Those, I think I'm just gonna do freehand. I don't think I'll even bother drawing. Ricky Boscarino tries his hand at everything. No material or object escapes his interest. So there we have the beginning of a weather vane. I let the machines and the material know who's boss. Carpenter, welder, jeweler, painter, we can safely say that Ricky is a jack of all trades. 
It's hard to describe exactly what Ricky's style is. It's all over the place and, and, and focused at the same time. I admire the way that he can uh, combine different materials in ways that you probably, or most people would probably not to think to do. One of the first works that earned Ricky notoriety came to him in adolescence. Fascinated by insects, he worked in a university laboratory. The maintenance areas below the school, there were these gigantic cockroaches scurrying all over. And I caught them and I had this idea, it wouldn't be funny to set them up into dioramas. So the first one I made, um, I had set them up, the dead cockroaches, in uh, a setting where they were sitting at a little table with food that I made out of crumbs and objects that I'd found um, around the house even. And it was a tremendous hit. People thought it was absolutely hilarious. And then people started requesting them to make them is sitting at their desk. Then everything moves very quickly. The media takes an interest in Ricky's creations, which end up on postcards. Soon, dioramas are being sold across America, and an artistic creative process becomes a commercial one. These changes don't suit Ricky, who decides to drop everything to pursue a more ambitious project. <laughs> When I bought this house, then a lot of things changed because my focus wasn't so much on individual pieces, but the focus was on constructing the house, um, all the trappings of the house, more of the whole concept of creating this environment where every detail was wrought somehow. It was all very intentionally uh, thought out, but that still hasn't stopped the fact that I do need to make a living, so I need to make pieces to sell as well. So it's kind of a juggling act. I have to balance the things I need to make a living and the things that I need for my own folly. Ricky lives and finances his main work with proceeds from the sale of his jewelry. But how can he find time to build a house while drawing, producing, and selling his own creations? It's a tricky problem that Ricky still has to cope with. I think the main challenges for Ricky on an artistic level are the fact that he has to fund everything that you see around him, and um, which means that he has to do a lot of shows with his jewelry and, and do quite a bit of traveling because all of the changes and additions to the building cost money. So uh, I'm sure that he would like to retire from the jewelry business and just focus entirely on the house, but um, at the moment, you know, practically speaking, he has to earn money to fund everything. I mean, look at how much money this costs. I mean, so he's, uh, you know, he's in debt to this place. Uh, so that, I know, has been challenging and worrisome to him. Um, particularly now, he's stuck in sort of a high-interest mortgage and nobody wants to refinance because of the eccentricity of the house and, and things like that. Eccentric he may be, but that hasn't stopped him from following the local construction codes to the letter. When he's, you know, when he builds his place every time he does an addition or whatever it is, he has to comply with the building codes and you know, the building inspector, or else he wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, do what he has to do. So even though it's not a structure like you would normally see in normal, you know, construction techniques, the basics are there. In other words, the, you know, the footings are under the walls, the re-rods are there. and the, the reality is that it's all up to code. In fact, it's over code. Uh, the fact that I'm building it myself, I spare no expense in the... Um, the, the, the structure, um, every aspect of it has to function. And one of the reasons is that I'm actually planning to live to 106. Um, I figured that I still have well, 53 years left. Um, so that's a, that's a good amount of time. That's like my whole lifetime. So I can't even imagine in another 53 years, what will this property look like? 
Um, I can't even imagine, actually. Sandyston, New Jersey is one of the first places in the United States to have been colonized by Europeans. It's a city rich in history. The early settlers came from Kingston, New York, who came from Europe, from Kingston down along the Old Mine Road to this area and on down to Park Quarry, Pennsylvania. The Old Mine Road is the oldest known road in America. It's about 104 miles. This is the Westbrook Bell House. It was settled by the Westbrooks. They came and settled here around 1701, and this house had nine generations of the same family, Westbrooks to Bells, that lived here. When I grew up, Sanderson is just basically about the same as it is now. Uh, the school, believe it or not, is the same size <coughs> as when I went to school. As far as the surrounding area, and here there's been, you know, new houses, of course, built, but most of the farms have stayed even though they aren't the active the dairy farms that they once were, you know, they're still in farmland preservation and the people have done that to keep it the rural community that it has been. The history and rural way of life in the region are certainly a source of inspiration for creatives like Ricky Boscarino. Just one hour from New York, the artist has found what he most lacked in the city, space and freedom. Many people moved up here including myself, to get away from population and not be on top of your neighbors and not to have your neighbors snooping. And that's what's great about living here, even to this day. It's live and let live. In the warmer months, you have a lot of campers and fishermen and um, then people traveling to go up to the lakes. We got the best food there is, I think, in the north part. You're here at the, uh, the Layton store. Our signature dish is a jar platter. It's the really only homemade handmade jar in the area. You have to travel to New York City now to get the jar that we have. We make homemade pies from scratch, um, a lot of other really yummy baked goods, and some groceries. We sell antiques. We have an antique store upstairs also with all kinds of crafts and goodies like that. Well, this is Eberhardt's Fresh Pickens. And we love good coffee, we love uh, marzipan, and we particularly love antiques and vintage furnishings and collecting. But the region's most unusual collection is just down the main road. Here is a tale of my friend's cat that had to be removed when the cat was injured. Um, here's a jar with my, um, the testicles of my two cats. So these are some bones that I've been collecting for years and years. These are fox bones, uh, deer bones, jaw bones from local uh, cows. This is a bone chandelier. This is um, a straw that was used by Monica Lewinsky when she was uh, being filmed for an interview and it still has her lipstick on the screen. I have literally tens of thousands, actually I might even have a couple million of these bread tabs. Hasn't quite gelled what I'm gonna do with them yet. Someday I'll have that spark of inspiration. Oh goodness, Ricky's bought all different kinds of things from us. Um, unusual frames, like big frames, and then he's, you know, made art out of them, and we've seen them in his house. Um, I think some candelabras. He always goes for the unusual things, which is so cool, you know, someone who can appreciate that stuff. Most of Ricky's life is occupied making jewelry for his business and working on Luna Park. But he still finds time to share his talents with the young artists attending the Peters Valley School of Craft. Peters Valley School of Craft began in 1970. This is a small artist community. Um, there were maybe four or five artists in residence and studios. And since then, it's turned into a uh, premier craft school. The Peters Valley School of Craft is now one of the biggest craft schools in the country. Artists everywhere come here to share their knowledge with students. 
And year after year, the arts community in Sandyston grows. It's a wonderful resource for um, teaching as well as attending classes for me. I have taught several workshops there in sculpture and uh, cement forming and mosaic tiling. Up here, everybody is so laid back and easygoing. It's that, you know, whatever somebody wants to do with their property, as long as it's within the code and within the law, nobody bothers anybody about it. Nobody worries about what your next door neighbor is doing. It makes life interesting, you know? No cookie cutter there, you know? Yeah, so, you know, you live in a very rural area. There are farmers, but, you know, well, you have to realize it's an area where um, there are people who have lived here for many, many years, and then there's a lot of people who come from outside. They want to live that country life and get away from the city. So there's a good mixture of people. You know, it's a great place where it's a whole melting pot of, of redneck and gay people and, and musicians, writers, actors, all living up here now, and it's really a great community. People are seeking out communities like Sandiston. Um, artists certainly respond to them because uh, of the sense of community, of, of a different pace. Um, you know, making art takes time. You know, making good work t is, is a slow process. Luna Park is still a work in progress, but even though its silhouette is familiar to everyone in Sandyston, it still manages to raise eyebrows. Every time I come here, you get the wow, look at that, wow, look at that, wow, you know? You can't take it in all at once. This is the place where you have to come, you know, over the years and just try to take it in little by little. If the eye is first intrigued by the unusual appearance of the home, the strange surrounding satellite objects deserve closer attention. Well, Ricky gets his inspiration from just about anything. Insects, nature, plants, fungus. Um, that's a great inspiration for Ricky. The outdoors, landscape, um, pieces of what we would consider garbage, I think, are inspiration for Ricky. Um, just about anything could be an inspiration for Ricky. You can never tell. He does find old objects that he sees the art, the intrinsic artistic value in them. Um, and placed in the setting of Luna Park, they fit. Sometimes they wouldn't fit anywhere else. Oh, good morning. Welcome to Luna Park. Come on in. Luna Park is not officially open to the public, but Ricky is aware that even hidden deep in the woods, his fantasy world arouses curiosity. So on occasion, he offers a guided tour. So Luna Park is my home, and uh, I've been here for 25 years now, and it's been nonstop activity ever since. This is my library, which is actually newly assembled. It's not just books, but it's a lot of different artifacts that I've uh, collected. Pieces of the Berlin Wall that I collected in Berlin. I happened to be there when the wall was coming down. This room I call the cantina, and eventually all the walls will be covered with mosaic. And in particular, this wall illustrates that. Here we have fallopian tubes and ovaries, and it um, is fertilized. It just states, you know, you, you think about these ideas and rehashed, and all of a sudden, pop, pops out, and it's a miracle. You know, it's a, the miracle of creation. So this, this wall is actually kind of sums up my, my philosophy on how it all happens. So this is my kitchen, the heart of the house. I do love cooking, so uh, this is actually a very well-equipped uh, kitchen. You'll notice that the walls are all corks. They look like they're bamboo from a distance. I would estimate there's probably about 
20,000 wine bottle corks in this, uh, in this room. For me, as, as large as the house has gotten, this part of the house is really still very sentimental to me, and it, I think it's kind of significant to, um, to see how this whole project started. It started as a very humble, dilapidated, seasonal hunting cabin, and now it's turned into, um, I don't know what it's turned into, it's, it's out of control, basically, is what it is. And he, I remember early on, he started talking about, well, I'm gonna add the, what he called the ballroom. And I remember he talked about that for, geez, years, I mean, seven years or so. Kept talking about the ballroom that he was gonna build. And we're all like, oh, sure, sure. So we're gonna go upstairs into the new part of the house. This is my ballroom. So this is where I have state dinners and summit meetings and the general meeting area for, uh, for dancing and whatever. So, uh, but uh, to me, this is more like a museum of my artifacts from places that I visited all over the world. The ballroom is the largest room added to the original structure. Purchased for $90,000, the house is now worth a million and a half, according to the builder. Now, there are 13 levels in this house, and that's just the way construction happened. Um, I had to conform the building to the land, which is a very gradual slope. There are certain rooms that are full stories, and then some are just a few steps. So this is level five. This is my music room, and it's um, a collection of musical instruments in various states of disrepair. I have lots of friends who are musical, so many times at gatherings there's uh, impromptu jam sessions happening. So that's is really a fun, fun room to, uh, to have. This is a really fun project. I just started using all of my old credit cards, hotel keys. Sometimes things lay around for years, maybe even decades, before I get this inspiration of what to do with them. So up here, this is my painting studio. I do uh, portraits and landscapes. It's very different than my other crafts that are very tactile and um, very dirty and messy using fire. But uh, there's something very calming uh, to me about painting. And I love being up here. I don't spend nearly enough time up here in my painting studio. So this room is also very sentimental to me. This one I, I refer to as the Zen room. And the idea for this room, it was supposed to be just a room of pillows. Right. Actually, in some of my, my pillows, this is a project that someone made for me, which was a, a embroidered pillow with the image of my house. So this is where I, I come when I, when I feel like I need to go back to the womb. But the area that Ricky is most proud of is one floor down. He calls it his pièce de résistance. And even though it's arguably the most intimate part of the house, it's also the most talked about. His bathroom. Uh, well, <laughs> uh... His bathroom. Hot stuff. Legendary. <laughs> it's, uh, it is a place unto itself. In fact, so many people go in there not even realizing they're in the bathroom. So in these early stages of the house, I lived very simply with rudimentary plumbing and my outhouse and, um, and a wood stove. And it was sort of like camping. And then I had this grand idea after seeing the old Turkish baths and um, the baths of Caracalla in Rome. And I had to travel to India as well and I saw some of the the salons and bathrooms of the um, 
the, the, Mughal, the Mughal sultans. And I thought to myself, that's what I need. I need a glorious bathroom that is so over the top that um, it'll be like the, the jewel of the house. So the bathroom contains nearly one million pieces of ceramic, either it's a, a shard, a tile shard, or ceramic object. This is one of my favorite parts of the, uh, the bathroom, is my bathtub and the spout. There are a few things that I really needed. I said I must have a urinal, I must have a bidet, and I wanted to have a shower in the middle of the room. It's almost like you're, you're outside in nature, but um, this is a great bathroom. It's really, it's really uh, a great sensory uh, uh, experience. That project took about five years, and it was, um, it was a colossal project, but it was so much fun from the very beginning, planning the fixtures, planning the space, and then uh, the construction stage, and then uh, the tiling, the mosaic tiling, which took about two years, and uh, then the stained glass windows, which took another year or so. So the whole project was very complicated, but it really, even to this day, the bathroom is like the gem of the house. Despite its scale and 13 levels, the home is not where Ricky spends the most time. He's more often found outside in his workshop. Hi, Greg. Oh, hello. Hi, welcome to Clay Day. Yeah, thank you. Nice to be here. What you got? Oh, just some tiles. I'm going to uh, glaze. Ricky started the clay day, I'm assuming, just to bring people together and to work on clay. And his his role is to facilitate that for people, have, give, them, give them access to his tools and you know, to instruct them if they need instruction and show them how to do certain things and then make dinner and, and things like that. Where's the RT? The RT. Well, oh. damn it. <laughs> Don't show Greg. Oh. <laughs> Coming to Ricky for Play Day since 1995 has been very inspiring as an artist and as a somewhat like-minded person with Ricky. And and I find that in my life and Ricky's life and all my friends' lives over the years, creative people tend to find each other and find uh, a community there. And I think this is one of the centers of that community uh, at Luna Park. It's just having the form itself is what I, is the key. That's what I think. I mean, anytime you have a question about how to do something, Ricky jumps right in. He, is, it, he loves to do that. He loves to show people how to do things. I mean, he's always talking about art, so that's really who he is. And um, plus, he's incredibly generous. That's that's the one um, word I would use to describe him more than any other. He's always doing something. Yeah. We spent, I don't know, maybe four hours, five hours together, and... You know, I may have built one of my heads, I do these heads, and he'll have done 20 tiles or whatever, you know. He just never, never stops. He's incredibly prolific <laughs> and imaginative. The open house Ricky hosts twice a year to showcase his creations has become a major event in the area. Many of the people say, I know he's up there, I have to get up there, and somebody else will be standing there and say, you haven't been to Ricky's yet? To Luna Park? Oh, you have to go, I'm gonna go. I think when you mention Ricky's name, people smile and say, oh, have you been to Luna Park? I mean, they get very excited. I think it's a, a place that 
that is a pride, a local source of pride. Luna Park? Oh yeah. And you know, when he has his open houses, um, he always sends everyone over here for lunch if they're coming, you know, in the area. We really appreciate that. And it's amazing just how many people come from all over the place. Tourism industry, you know, we're trying to build it up, you know, in the town. And of course, Ricky is helping with that. You know, it, it's just, he's getting to be well known. So if people come to see his place, we hope that they stop like here, the Leighton store or the Angel store or, or stop over at the Leighton hotel and come. So, you know, one thing adds on to the other. Through his work, Ricky believes he's making a lasting contribution to his community, but he would like to do more. He dreams of one day becoming mayor of Sandyston. I'd like to be mayor because I really love this town and I would like to be a part of what actually preserves the serenity of this town and that it would always be possible for someone to build something, um, not necessarily like Luna Park, but certainly something in their own vision. Would I vote for him? Sure. Sure, I'd vote for him. Why not? I would vote for Ricky. <laughs> well, I can't. I don't live here, so. <laughs> but I would vote for him, certainly. Of course, I'd vote for Ricky for mayor. He's already sort of mayor. <laughs> or king, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> well, I don't see um, Luna Park ever being finished in a conventional sense. Um, and I think that's probably the way that Ricky wants it. I think that um, he, it's always going to be an ongoing art project. I think he started out with a dream, and he's built on that dream. And I think his house reflects everything he loves, inside and out. I don't think he's limited to one type of art. I think he likes everything. The message in all of this in Ricky's world and in Luna Park, um, follow your inspiration. Don't, don't limit yourself. Make your dream happen, yeah. Ricky has also devoted himself to the art of poetry. One day, we'll be able to read on Luna Park's website this poem, Luna Park's mission statement of sorts. The secret symbols in the halls bear heavy burden on the walls. Conundrums spawn enigma reign as the reign of Ray remains. Feck and folly never falter for progeny that follow after. To question truth, decipher riddle, how light and dark meet in the middle. This is a greeting, an invitation to explore unconvention. To those basking in the light, this beckons to incite in sight, and those emerging from the dark, a welcome from the patriarch to a curious cabinet called Luna Park.